Today on Women of Impact, I'm hanging with one of the sweetest humans on the planet, the wonderful Robin McGraw. And today she shares her intimate secrets behind her 49 year relationship with the love of her life, Dr. Phil. So he gave me what, would, what I could use to push his button and I've never ever used it in 49 years I've never used it and how on earth she's able to maintain her independent badass self with her own hopes and dreams when you say strong ass woman I am a strong woman and I knew what I would and would not put up with host of the I've Got a Secret podcast, as well as the New York Times bestselling author, she reveals the importance of setting boundaries in her marriage. That's so powerful. It's not selfish to put yourself first. To non-negotiables, deal breakers, and so, so much more. That's a very, very sensitive subject because you tell someone what's going to push your button, then you're giving them ammunition. So guys, whether you're single looking for a happy long-term relationship, right, or if you're in a relationship and committed to making it work till the day you take your dying breath, then lean in because this one is for oh, you. I love that. Welcome to Women of Impact. Welcome to the show. Oh, thank you so much. I have been dying for you to come here. Yes, me I've, too, Dillo. I've been such a big fan of yours, and I want to break down why, because I think it, this is exactly where I want to talk about in this episode. Okay. So I was a stay-at-home wife for eight years. I was watching you on TV in the audience as ah. this just incredible supporting wife to this, you know, very incredible man, Dr. Phil. Yes. And I was watching, and I was like, wow, that's so beautiful to see this woman be such, such a supportive wife. And then as I developed myself, I started to struggle with being a supportive wife and being independent and being my own person. Mm -hmm. And girl, when I look at you, Ugh. the misconception I had of you, and I, it was a misconception that you were just, quote unquote, yes. a supportive wife, right? But you weren't. You're entrepreneur, you're business savvy, you're the brains behind, <laughs> you know, like I think um, Dr. Phil calls you his feminine conscience. Uh -huh. Yes. Um, and so that's really what I want to talk about in how you're able to be this badass, independent, strong woman that doesn't need anyone and at the same time be this beautiful, supporting, loving uh, wife, mother and grandmother. Yes. So break it down for me. Let's start with you're in the audience. You're this incredibly supportive wife. You have children. You said that you were meant to be a mother. Yes. How in those moments are you able to still think of yourself? Well, I... I have to go back then and to answer that question because, uh, first of all, when we came out here, it was a completely different life for us. We had been married already at least 28 years already when we moved out here and started this whole new life. Uh, I had never gone to work with him. I was a stay-at-home mom and I was raising our two boys and because this was, again, I'm going to say a whole new life, things did change. Things were different. And even then, when we came here and he started the show, I had no intentions of going to that show every day. I went to that very first show along with our two sons and some good friends because we wanted to support Philip. I wanted to support mm -hmm. him. I was so proud of him and always have been because I've always thought he was a brilliant man. From the moment I met him, I thought, you are so brilliant and so precious and so adorable. And I loved him so much. People have always asked me, and so I in turn will ask a lot of people, do you believe in love at first sight? Because I do. I fell in love with him the moment I met him. And it's been that way from, from the moment I met him. I've always thought he was brilliant and I've always been in love with him. So moving out here for him to start that show was to me what he was meant to do. He was meant to have this show and, and reach millions of people and help them because he can. And so we all came, I came to the very first show to support him. And from that day forward, I have been at every show because uh, I was there, he finished the show and no one had decided how he would end the show. They had all these pre-taped meetings, you know, design the set, 
come up with show <laughs> topics. They had planned everything, but they didn't plan on how he would end the show. So he ended it. He said, you know, I've just finished the first show. Thank you for watching, whatever he said. And then he just walked. His instinct was to come over to me because I'm sitting there like, this, you're brilliant. That was wonderful. So he just walked over to me. The cameras were still rolling. He has an executive producer called Carla Pennington. She's been with him since day one. And so she has the cameras continue to roll. Mm -hmm. He walks over to me. I stand up. I'm like, you were brilliant. That was fabulous. He goes, come on, let's let's talk about it. Let's walk off. Let's talk about it. Come with me. We walked off together to talk about it. And Carla said, that's brilliant because she could see him being now the husband, mm -hmm. the man. He he was the, the real Dr. Phil as a husband. And she loved that look and she loved what she was capturing. And so on stage, he's the Dr. Phil. And as we walk off, he's the husband and the real man. And she wanted to capture that. So she came running out from the control room as we were getting back, going backstage. And she said, oh, my God, that was my sleepless in Seattle moment. Can you please come to every show? And I went, oh, and I didn't have to. Hes I only hesitated for a second because I had a young son that didn't have a driver's license yet. And I was driving him to school every day and picking him up. And I said, well, that depends. I still need to drive Jordan to school and pick him up. So, and they adjusted this tape schedule such that I could do that. So I would get up every morning, drive Jordan to school, then head to the studio and sit there because I really wanted to see him do his thing. So I had been to every show since then. And that's why I was there because I wanted to support him and, and everyone at the show. That's so beautiful. And just seeing the way you light up yeah. after 45 years. I yes. need people to actually hear 45 years. Yes. So whether someone right now is single looking for somebody, just got in a relationship, I think ultimately the goal, hopefully, is to be with someone for the rest of your yes. life. But not yes. just be with someone, be in a very happy, loving relationship. Yes. But I'm going to pull a quote up and I really want to know, you said, as much as we love our partners, the one thing we need to love more is ourselves. Yes, yes. So talk to me about, you've got this man that you really love. You say he's brilliant. For you, you really feel like you're filling out your purpose. I don't mm -hmm. want to speak for you, but I've mm -hmm. heard you say your family was really your purpose, yes. your kids, your husband. Yes. So in that moment, he's like, hey, this is what I'm requesting of you. Be here, you know, every single day. And how many episodes? 3,000 Over 3,000. Now it's, it's almost 35 not 3,500, but yes. Which is insane just yes. to do the math on how yes. many hours and days yes. that becomes. Yes. So how do you navigate that? Where you're there, 3,000 episodes, you're in the audience, you're looking your husband with beauty and awe. And yet, to the quote, you still need to put yourself first. Yes, yes. Well, because I believe my purpose in life has always been and I told Philip this when we were actually when we were dating. Uh, I, I believe I was put on this earth to be a wife and mother. And I've never, ever doubted that. Mm -hmm. So I do live with live my life with purpose and with meaning because I know I'm doing what I was put on this earth to do. And I made certain he understood that and he believed it, too. So I believe in a marriage, in a partnership, both, both persons in the, in the relationship need to understand how the other one feels and believes and what they believe their purpose is. I believe that's my purpose and I needed him to understand it and he does and he supports it. If they're conflicted about their partner's purpose, it's, it's never gonna really work, I believe. So when we were dating, but knew we would be together for the rest of our lives. I had to make sure he understood what my purpose was and he could support that. And he needed to, I needed to know what his purpose was in life and I could support that. So it was an understanding that we had before we ever got married. That's amazing. And I actually have a bunch of things. I've got like seven things that I've heard you say that I believe are honestly the fundamental things to how you've been able to spend 45 yes. years yes. in a happy marriage and still be the badass woman that you are today. Thank um, you. So talk to me then, because the reason why I bring that up is well, I want to go down the, the things mm -hmm. that I've heard you say. Okay. But really, f first fundamentally, it really is how do you adjust to that as you change and grow because uh -huh. your purpose does change and grow right your yes. kids have grown up and yes. you know so 
talk to me about changing your purpose. And even though you said it when you first got married, mm -hmm. you know, you have your own podcast, you yes. help all these charities. Yes. So how did you navigate that? Well, I will say this. Before we got married, we had lots of conversations, lots of conversations about how we wanted to live our lives together mm. for the rest of our lives. And yes, we both were very aware that we were going to change. We were going to grow together and we were going to change. And, and our, our loves of, of what we wanted to do with our lives would change. But we made sure that we were going to talk with each other. We were going to visit with each other and we were going to make those changes together. And we were going to allow each other to have those changes mm -hmm. and we were going to respect each other. So before we got married, we had conversations that, about what was important to to like, I would tell him what I needed to know. He understood. He needed to know my deal breakers and I needed to know his. And so for, for example, he needed to know because I grew up with a father who was an alcoholic. My father adored me and I knew it. I adored him and he knew it. I have three older sisters and a twin brother and he loved his children. We all knew that, but he was an alcoholic and, and I understood it was a disease. And sadly, he could not, could not fight that disease. And so the one thing he could do for his children and his wife was when he would have to go on a binge and, and, and drink, they would last sometimes four and five days, he would go away to do it. He never drank alcohol in front of me or my mother or any of us. He would go away, but that caused me to live my life of certainty because I never knew when it was going to happen. I never knew when he was just not going to come home. And so I let Philip know, this is how I've lived my life. And so you need to know, I will never raise my children in a home with an alcoholic. And so I asked him like on the second date, do you drink alcohol? Do you, in excess, do you drink alcohol? And he goes, actually, I think I'm allergic to alcohol. He said, I don't drink at all. And that's when I said, I think I love you. You're the one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to tell you, I already know I love you, but. I really know I love you. Like, I so want to really dive deep, deep on this because I think it's so important. I call them non-negotiables. And so there's a couple of things there. There's one, A, that it's very impressive that you saw that and said, I don't want it. A lot of people mm -hmm. end up repeating that behavior because that's all they've seen. So that's it's right. almost they're that's drawn right. to it. That's but right. But you're the opposite. You saw it, assessed it, and said, hey, this is a non-negotiable. I think I was about 14 years old and mm. I was in bed one night. And I made that decision. I, I can remember being in bed thinking, looking at the ceiling, knowing my father wasn't home and not knowing when he'd come home. And I just made a decision. I will not marry an alcoholic and I will not raise my children in a home with an alcoholic. That I knew for certain. And I told Philip that probably on our second date. And setting people up for success like that is so important because, you know, I've heard you say, it's like, say it for, from the get go. That way, if it's, it doesn't compute with them, then you just break up and, you know, it's fine. Yes. Instead of realizing five years down the line, oh, there was a sign in mm -hmm. the first day. Yes. And I didn't actually say this was an unnegotiable. Yes. yes. Why didn't I tell him I wouldn't accept this? Because right. that's when you say strong ass woman, I am a strong woman. And I knew what I would and would not put up with. I knew I was put on this earth to be a wife and mother, a loving, devoted wife and a loving, passionate, devoted mother. And I, so I put the pressure on myself as well, but I also put the pressure on my husband and my children, but, but it's a good pressure. It's a good payoff pressure mm -hmm. because, and Phillips always said, you know, you make the, I'll make the living, you make the living worthwhile. Mm -hmm. I said, deal. So we, we had those kind of conversations. Philip, here's what I will and will not live yes. with. I can remember Philip telling me, you know, if you'll just tell me what I'm doing wrong, because if you don't tell me, how am I going to know? I'm like, well, that's true. If you'll just tell me what I'm doing wrong, I, I just won't do it anymore. Mm. You don't have to pout. You mm. don't have to throw a fit. You don't have to do anything. Just, just say, hey, I don't really like it when you do that. So if you tell me, I won't do it anymore. And if I do it, then you'll know I'm doing it full well knowing you don't like it when I do it. So why would I do it? Mm -hmm. So I promise you, you tell me I'm, what I'm doing, I won't do it anymore. So conversations are so important and we have them all the time. I love that. And I really do think that some, like, 
even people now, let's say they're deep in a relationship. I, I, I think it's important to not just say it's, oh, it's too late. Go, okay, today's day one. So day one, let's just sit down and write out our non-negotiables. Let's just talk exactly. about it openly. Because it, people weren't really talking about boundaries back then. That wasn't really a word, right? But now it's like people, if you say, hey, I think it's important and healthy for us both to set boundaries. Exactly. It can come, become exactly. beautiful. Exactly. Because, you know, Philip and I wanted to be married and we wanted to be happily married. Mm -hmm. So why not list what would allow us to be happily married, but also list what would upset us. So, so we had the conversation like, okay, here's what's going to push my button. So it's very, it's imperative that you be vulnerable with each other and say, if you want to know what's going to push my button, here it is. So, okay. He's told me what's going to push his button. Why would I want to do that? I don't want to do that. So that's a very, very sensitive subject because you tell someone what's going to push your button, then you're giving them ammunition. And if you're with someone who, oh, that's so bad. Mm -hmm. And see, I love him. I want him happy. Why would I want to push his button? I'm not that person. I want him happy. So he gave me what would, what I could use to push his button. And I've never ever used it in 49 years. I've never used it. His father was a severe alcoholic as well. And he witnessed and heard th his father do things and witnessed his father doing things that he will never forget. And he, one of his buttons was don't ever compare me to my father. Mm -hmm. Don't ever say, Oh, you, you sound just like your father. You are acting just like your father. Now he loved his father, but he did not appreciate or respect some of the things he did. And so he told me, just, I'm just asking you never ever to compare me to my father in a negative way like that. Mm -hmm. I have never, ever, ever even thought of doing that. That's so powerful because there, I'm sure there are moments, right? You don't have a perfect marriage. I don't think no, anyone has. No one's so there's certain moments where I'm, I can imagine you're probably screaming at each other or you're We've really... never raised our voices. Oh, you've never screamed. Never. Oh, that's We're not that way. Interesting. We're not that way. But see that we're not that way. Oh, I just got chills. We're not that way. But that was another conversation we had. So we can get mad and go, oh, you know, that kind of thing. But if it's in the, if we're heated and we're mad at each other, it's a very calm, you know, <laughs> like that. Like that. So... So it's not that we don't get mad at each other. Right. Oh, yes, we do. But we don't settle it by screaming and yelling and slamming doors. No, I, I won't. I won't accept that. I and you won't either. God, okay. So I just, you, you're just hitting me with so many great <laughs> stuff. Like I want to keep breaking this down. Okay. So you don't scream. I love that. Mm -mm. Tom and I have never called each other names. Never. Ever. That is off the that table. That would break my heart. <laughs> yeah. That's... That would make me so mad. I would never let him forget it. Right. And to me, that's off the table, right? Yeah. Going back to the non-negotiables. So establishing, okay, look, we don't scream at each other. Like all of these things are so healthy. And I'm going to go back to, girl, 45 years, it's not an accident. So I'm going to nope. keep taking these nuggets of gold and putting them in my pocket. Okay. Um, but not using their vulnerabilities as a weapon is huge. And you just can't ever take it back. Like, you right. can't take it back. That's right. That's right. And you know what I do? I journal. Okay. I can tear him up in a journal. Okay. <laughs> I do. I journal because I mean, we're all normal. Yeah. We're, all, we're all, no one's perfect. And I can get really upset with him or, 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 you know, frustrated. And I journal. I get all that out because at the end of whatever I'm writing, I go back and start listing everything I absolutely adore about him because I do. I absolutely adore him. And could not live without him. Mm. But that's really powerful, right? Mm -hmm. Saying that you journal, I think I actually never even, it never occurred to me to write out a journal on mm -hmm. moments like this. Normally what I do when I'm in an, a debate or an argument with my husband, I write down all the things that I'm upset about. Mm -hmm. And then I kind of go back and go, why was I upset about that? Why did that yes. bother me? Yes, because I will tell you this. I love to go back and read my journaling. Mm. I love to do that because I'll think, wow. I can't believe I was that upset because I will journal until I'm through it and maybe I'm not completely through it. So I'll journal some more and maybe for a couple of days or whatever, but I love to go back and read it and think, wow, okay, we got through it. 
I love that. Yeah. Talk to me about sacrifice. I mean, obviously being with someone for so long, um, you know, putting putting other people first, like putting your family first. I get why we do that. I put my husband first a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and so in a marriage, in a relationship, in any relationship, I think there are elements of sacrifice. And it seems like the message is somewhat changing now. It's like, you shouldn't have to give up anything for your partner. They need to. But I actually don't think that serves the relationship. You know, I, I've always had the belief that I deserve to be just as happy as I'm making my family. Mm -hmm. I've always, I've always had that. Now, Philip has always been very, very good about supporting me, taking care of myself. Uh, I said earlier something about the fact that being the only woman in the house, raising my boys and being married to a man, you know, was always really very nice uh, because Philip was very good about teaching our boys respect women, respect your mother. Mm. And uh, so it was, a, it was a very obvious rule and, and belief in our home to respect me and all women. Mm. So I was raised that way. So that is ingrained in me because I was raised that way and Philip believes that as well and I raised boys. So it's just something that I respect myself and I always have. I respect who I am and what I stand for and I I have always believed that and I've made sure Philip understood that before we got married. And do you, th that's amazing, but so do you think that that's the, one of the biggest keys of how you're able to sacrifice without feeling like you're giving things up? Because, yes, because it's not really a sacrifice. It's what I was put on this earth to do and it's what I want to do to, to take care of my husband and my boys and, but also take care of myself. Now, I will say it was driven home in a big way when my mother died very suddenly at a very young age age of 58. Um, and I truly believe it's because she never put herself first. And she took care of all of us and my father and never went to the doctor. And she died suddenly of undiagnosed heart disease. And I know for a fact that had she gone to the doctor just one time, she might still be here. So I really was just convinced that I needed to even step it up even more and put myself first. Mm -hmm. And that, that was the basis of my company revelation and my foundation, everything and my, my mission to tell women because I had the platform of the Dr. Phil show. It's not selfish to put yourself first. You have to take care of yourself so you can take care of those you love. And, uh, but I have always believed that, but because I had the ability with the platform of the Dr. Phil show to really put that message out to other women. Mm. It was very important to me to do that after losing my mother so suddenly. I was on the phone to her and she said, I feel funny. And I said, what do you mean by funny? And she was already dead. She had died right as the moment she said that. So it's always been my belief in myself, but it's been my mission since I lost her to, to convince others it's not selfish to put yourself first. God, yeah, and I mean, your books that you've written mm -hmm. have been so impactful. Um, you. you know, I, I can't remember which book it was where you said, we find ourselves, you know, rushing our kids to the doctors mm -hmm. the second there's something wrong. Yes. But I haven't been to the doctor in years. Yes. Yes. And I think, I think sadly, women tend to do that. They, they're, they are the, the matriarch of the family. So we do believe our jobs are to take care of our young children and our husbands and our elderly parents. Everyone does look to the matriarch of the family to do that. Mm -hmm. So we tend to put ourselves last when it comes to our health and to our peace of mind, to relaxation, anything. We tend to put ourselves last. And sadly, I think we pay the price for that. My mother did, I know. Mm. And so in those moments now, like, do you push yourself to remind yourself you need to take care of yourself? No, I really never have. <laughs> That's amazing. I really never have. Um, I will not. Of course, I want my children raising my boys and my husband. I always wanted to make sure I was doing my job. But um, if I knew I needed some time to myself or even daily, I would prepare the meal. I would sit down. But the minute everyone was fed and it was time to just kind of chill, I was up. I said, OK, Philip, they're all yours. I'm going to go soak in the tub because that was just something I enjoyed doing. 
-hmm. at the end of the day, soaking in the tub, lighting a candle, meditating, praying, whatever. But that was my time and I never hesitated to take it. So that was something simple, but that was my time. God, I love that so much. I struggled with that for sure. I went all in on being the supportive wife. I was like, I gave up everything that I liked, yep. enjoyed, wanted to do in life. I prided myself on being a great wife. Mm -hmm. Um, but I only prided myself in that and that I didn't feel good about myself in any other aspect of my life. Mm -hmm. And so everything you're saying is incredible. And, you know, um, it's so beautiful to know that not every woman has to struggle like that, right. but also giving the tips of communicating, telling your partner every day. Mm -hmm. Um, and I even heard you say, um, if you care about your kids, um, take care of their mother, take care if, of their mother. if you yes. care about your husband, take care of their wife. If you care about your parents, take care of their daughter. That's right. But I really, truly have always believed that. Uh, you know, I just, I just have always thought I will be a better mother. <laughs> I will be a better wife. I will be a better daughter if I know I've taken some time for myself. And Philip was always really very, always then and still is, very supportive, supportive of me taking girls trips. Mm. Uh, or if I would just want to go for the weekend to go see one of my sisters or having my sisters in or whatever. He has always been very supportive of that. So as I sit here right now, I think back about when we were first married and we had not, we didn't even have two dimes to have together. If I just wanted to go walk around the block, you know, just get out of the house or, or, or not prepare dinner that night. Like, I don't feel like cooking tonight. Okay. He's always been so supportive of of that kind of thing because I have always been supportive of him. Mm. How important, as you're talking, I'm like, wow, how important do you think it is that you as are as strong as you are? And the reason why I ask is your husband is, I, I haven't had the pleasure to meet him yet, but uh. larger than life. And I absolutely had a misconception that you were quiet, <laughs> um, somewhat docile, followed him. Um, and it is absolutely a flaw in my thinking as a female that that is what is needed with a strong man. And no. it's almost the opposite. I believe it is the opposite. And I think it is though, that because you're so strong minded mm -hmm. that that is an element that actually really works. Yes. And the same with my husband. I mean, he is such a force. I, I say, you know, I could easily get swept away by his giant wave. Yeah. I really could. Yeah. And I have in the past for eight years. Mm -hmm. And I realized that wasn't, that wasn't healthy. Mm -hmm. That wasn't healthy for me and that wasn't healthy for our relationship. Mm -hmm. So I started putting firm lines down, boundaries, Com uh, demanding um, selfish time. And he was always beautiful about it. He was like, yeah, of course, yeah, like, yeah. why wouldn't you? But I didn't ask it of myself. Yeah. And then once I started doing that, it actually helped our relationship because I wasn't, um, I was able to think about what was important to me. And that's really why I wanted to bring it up is that he seems like such a strong man mm -hmm. and you could have got swept away. Yes. So when I go, how did you not? It really, in this discussion, is really unraveling itself because mm -hmm. you are very firm in your beliefs. Yes. You know, I was raised, again, the youngest of five children. But being a twin played a big part because I was brought into this world thinking I needed to take care of him mm -hmm. because I was born five minutes before him. But we shared that womb, and I think that makes a big difference, big difference on personalities. And it's made, it shaped my personality. Mm. So I feel like I've been like a strong woman my whole life because I had someone I had to take care of. Plus we were the youngest of five children. And while we were always spoiled and taken care of by our sisters and our parents and everything, I, it just, I had this, this strong personality that I always felt loved. I always felt loved and adored. And I can remember going into my relationship with Philip saying with a personality such like, now listen, uh, you have to love and adore me and think I'm cute. 
or I won't be happy. Did you really say yes. that? Yeah, I yes. love that. Because my father and my, I've been loved and adored my whole life. Mm. So jokingly would say that to him, but that's kind of how I presented myself. Like, okay, so now here's how it's going to be. Got it. So that's amazing. I want to give you one extra little thing that you missed out that I think it is so powerful that you do is that you chose. So a lot of people look at their childhood and say, I'm this way because of that in a, in a negative sense. Yeah. No. And everything that you've said, you had a choice. You had a choice to look at your father and find someone that's an alcoholic, but yes. you didn't. You had a choice. And look, while a lot of us have struggled and that's such an important part that you have chosen. And there's one thing, a perfect example that I heard you say, and I was like, this is, this is, how other people would get divorced over this very thing. You were just like, ah, whatever. So you, I believe your mother had just passed away uh -huh. and you wrote so many heartfelt letters, responses yes. to people who had yes. written, reached out saying, I'm so sorry about your mom. You wrote, in fact, why don't you tell us the story? Oh, yes. We, I'll start with the fact that we bought an old home. It was an old home. We, we built a home and brand new home. We were living in it and, and, Someone wanted to buy it and just overnight we decided to sell this home and bought this, buy this old, old house because I wanted to remodel it. I wanted to, so we had to move in the middle of the night. It was, we moved overnight and it started raining. Oh, and it rained and rained. And so we got into this old house. Everything we owned was wet. The boxes were wet, everything. And so my mother came over and she said, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to help you unpack, but I'm going to run home and bake you a pumpkin pie. And because she was an amazing cook, she could bake and everything. And so, and I loved pumpkin pie. So she said, okay. I said, okay. So she went home to bake me that pumpkin pie. And then when she called and she said, sweetheart. And I went, oh, is my pie ready? She goes, I just took it out, the, out of the oven. But she said, uh, uh, is Phil there? And I said, no, he ran to the grocery store. And she said, oh, I just, I wanted to ask him something because I feel, I feel funny. And that's when I said, what do you mean by funny? And she passed. So it was so sudden and we had this outpouring of love and, and, and all these friends came over and here we are in this old empty house, damp house and everything. It was just a horrible time and everyone just rallied around and helped and everything. So I sat in this old nasty dining room, musty smelling dining room because I thought it's very, very important to me to write these thank you notes because it was, it was just a bad, bad time. It's like part of your therapy, right? It was part of my therapy, yes. So I sat there and I wrote hundreds of notes for two days at least and cried my eyes out with every one of them. But yeah, it was so cathartic. And uh, I got them all written. And so every morning when Philip would leave for, for work, he would pack this little, and I would do it for him too, but he would pack this little tennis bag because he would stop on the way home and play tennis, indoor tennis. And so uh, I gave him, I put all these notes in the two big Ziploc baggies. And I said, can you take these to the office with you and put them in the mail? He said, sure. So he, I unzipped the side of his little tennis bag and I put them all down in there. And he said, oh, and I said, great. And it was just like, oh, I got that done. Now I can focus on unpacking the house, all these boxes. And it was like six weeks later. And I was going to pack the tennis bag for him. And I reached down in there and I went and I felt those, those notes in the side of that bag. And, and he walked in the room just about the time I put my hand and he heard me touch those bag, that baggy, those Ziploc baggies full. And I went, Oh, and my eyes got so big and I just froze. And he went, Oh no. Because he took that bag to the office that day and he never thought another thing about it. And he used that bag every day. And he never even knew they were in there. He completely forgot about them. Six weeks later, I'm standing there and went, oh, my God. Oh, my God. You didn't mail the notes. And he went, oh, my. Oh, my. I'm so sorry. And I went, I thought they knew. All this time, I thought they knew. I've seen some of these people. I thought they knew. I thought they knew how I felt. And that's all I could say. I could cry right now. That's all I could say. I just kept thinking, I thought they knew. I, th I thought they knew. And he goes, oh, I'm so sorry. I went, and then just something, the, the sound of his voice, the, the sadness in his eyes. Oh, it broke my heart. I could cry right now. It broke my heart. I went, it's okay. It's okay. 
it's okay. And he went, no, it's not okay. It's not okay. I'm going to drive to everyone's house today and hand deliver it. And I'm going to tell them how much it meant to you to write to them. And, and it's my fault. And I'm going to tell them when you wrote him and I'm going to tell them how it's my fault. They didn't get it. And all this time you knew, I said, no, you don't have to do that. Just put them in the mail. And so then I'm like saying, no, 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 I can't. I can't. I have to do it. And I had to just beg him to not feel bad. In that moment, like as I heard you tell the story, I was like, these are the moments. These are the these moments. are the moments where how you responded is exactly why you guys are 45 years in marriage. Because contempt is one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, in my opinion, yeah. right? It's uh -huh. like you can easily get contempt in a relationship and you hold on to that. Mm -hmm. And a year later, two years later, three years later, you are at each other's throats. You're not seeing yep. eye to eye. You, you never get, mailed those notes. And I you, could do that. but And you throw out, you never mailed those notes. And you would have every right to, where people would be like, yeah, he didn't yeah, mail that, but those no, notes. No, I saw it. I saw the, the heartbreak in his eyes and I heard it in his voice. He And I knew he didn't do it on purpose. I and knew. so was that it? Like, I just told myself, I know who, because that's a big part of it, right? Reminding yourself of who they are, what their intentions are, and not just the intention, but how they act after. He didn't dismiss it. Um, so how do you, so in that moment, that's a beautiful story. And that's why I want to bring it up because I really do think it's those moments. It's those freaking moments that you, that can splinter a five-year relationship, let alone yes. a 45-year relationship. Yes. So have you had to actively work through forgiveness together on certain things? And what does that look like? Yes, yes. There's, there's a, a quote that I think is so powerful that I think really helps define who I am and who we are. Um, I never knew how strong I was until I chose to forgive someone who wasn't sorry and accept an apology that was never given. Because there are a lot of people out there that won't say I'm sorry and won't apologize. And, but we do, Philip and I do that. And, and I know when, when he says he's sorry, I know he means it mm. and he won't hesitate to apologize and I won't either. And so, and that was just one of the conversations that we had early on, like, Philip, here's what will break my heart. Mm. And you, you need to know, it. here's what will break my heart. So, don't ever call me a name. <laughs> mm. Don't ever be so mean to call me in because I'll never get over it. It'll break my heart. I, I, I'm so vulnerable to say, here's what'll break my heart. Because mm. he's like, oh, I don't want to ever break your heart. It's funny because I, I know what breaks my husband's heart. Mm -hmm. And what breaks his heart is me being upset. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes if we're in a debate or an argument and I feel like I want to cry, I walk away. Uh -huh. And he's always like, why are you walking away? And I'm like, because right now I need almost to cry, but I don't want this to influence the discussion because I don't want you to apologize yeah. and say you're sorry if you're not. Because just saying you're sorry doesn't help you actually address the issue. So I think we also need to address the issue. But I know you and I know that if you see me cry, I'm going to break your heart. You're going to feel bad. And now we wouldn't have resolved the problem. The conversation's over. Yes. Yeah. Is that also why I've heard you guys say, and again, I, we do this too, but like you guys say divorce isn't an option. Like you just take oh, that off the yes. table. Yes. Yes. We, we said that early on as well, because I said, we're not just going to be married. We're going to be happily married. So we're going to do what it takes to stay happily married. He goes, that's right. That's exactly right. And Philip did something that I think every, every couple should do. And he did it because when my, mother died so suddenly. Um, it rocked my, it rocked my world really, because it was the first, she was the first person I had ever lost. And so death was a reality. It was like, whoa, she's not coming back. She's not coming back. And it broke his heart to see me so upset, of course. And so I was sitting in our bedroom on the bed one day and just adjusting to everything that had happened. And it had been, you know, it'd been about six months and I, I just had had this one, I was just having a day where I just really missed her. And, mm. and he came in and he was looking for me. He came in and I was just sitting there and he goes, are you okay? And I said, oh yeah, I'm okay. I just, 
you know, I just had one of these moments where the finality of death is just overwhelming. I said, she's really not coming back. And I, I, I knew that, but I said, it was just, I was just having one of those moments. And he said, I know it's, it's, I know it's tough uh, when you lose someone for the first time. And I said, yeah, I said, uh, and he said, I want you to look me in the eye and hear me. He said, you need to know that there's nothing you can do ever. There's nothing you can say, nothing you can do that would make me ever leave you. And he said, not that, I, not that maybe you're wondering, but he said, but I want you to know and hear me, look me in the eye. He said, I will never leave you. I'm never going to leave you. And he finally said it like 10, 15 times because it was important to him. He knew I didn't really need to hear it because I'd never really thought it or wondered it. Mm. But I guess he thought, and maybe I would at some point, maybe there would be something that would happen. But he just thought, I just want you to know this. So where was the original conversation? Because you even just said, you know, I know that we always say divorce isn't an option. So he, had you yeah, had he, an initial conversation about that? That was one of our conversations before we got married. When we get married, it's forever. Yes. And it's forever happily married. Mm -hmm. So it was, that was part of that conversation. It's forever. Your divorce is off the table. We're never going to get it. Like, I love we're going to work at this and we're going to make it last forever. So we had that conversation. Divorce is never an option. We're never going to talk. We're never. And we made it so clear that we're not throwing divorce out there and we're upset with each other. Or we're in a conversation about well, you always do this or you always do that, whatever. So as a threat, we don't get to threaten each other with the divorce word. That is so important. Like Tom and I had that conversation yep. early on as well. I actually did say, we're never getting divorced unless you hit me or cheat on me. Those right, were my two right. things. Well, those were, there were, there was, uh, we had the deal breaker the list. The asterisks. Yeah yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's a deal breaker list. That divorce is on that list. Yes. But apart from that, I'm with, we actually call it the D word, like Voldemort yes. in Harry Potter, yes. like the, that thou the who yes. shall not be named. Yes. We use that with divorce yeah. because there has to be that reassurance that no matter, like there are days where I'm emotional. There are days that I've, you know, like acting in a way is like, I can't believe I acted like that, yes. you know, and, yes. and you just want to know that they're not going to take the, the, the first opportunity they can to back out. Yes. And again, yes. the threat, if you live in that fear, now you can't be honest. You can't say what you really think. Yes. You can't have the hard talks yes. because, oh, are they going to leave me if I have the hard talk? Yes. So, so we had made it clear that the D word could never be used ever. Like, I think I'm just going to tell him. I know we said this, but I think it's, I think we should get a divorce. And you know how people use that for, for drama. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. But we, that's, we don't do that. We've never done that. Yeah. So he made it clear. I'm never leaving, never leaving you. So I, I don't ever, I don't ever think that. But here's the payoff for having so many conversations and working really hard. The payoff is what, what the phase of life that we're in right now. And I'm, I call it the dessert phase of our life. We've raised our boys and we get to see what we've accomplished. We get to see our hard work in our children bringing our children into the world, raising them. They both are happy. We have, you know, our lives now to live with each other and just we have such payoffs to celebrate. I think it's so powerful that you spoke about phases and I'm really glad you brought that up because I think when you first meet someone, they've done brain scans. It basically looks like you're on cocaine, right? Yes. I mean, it, it's that heightened of the chemicals that are pumping in your body and the yes. endorphins and all of that. And then, which is why you, typically after a year or two, relationships starts to fizzle out because everything that you're talking about, people don't do all the work that is so yes. needed and involved in a marriage or in a, any relationship doesn't have to be marriage. And the fact that you talk about phase is so important because I think if you always think that it's going to be the same throughout your entire life, it's, it's almost setting yourself up for, for um, disaster, for, exactly. you know, to be unsuccessful. Exactly. So understanding the phases of yes. your life. Every, yeah, I think life is a different phase. The marriage is going to be a different phase and you, and you work towards the phase. I think we've worked towards this phase we're in now. 
and we're having so much fun. And, and you know, we, we went through a lot of different phases and that phase of leaving Texas and moving out here and him starting a whole new life was just so much fun. I know. So honestly, Robert, I could talk to you for so I long though. You have just such an incredible insight. What you've Thank done you. is just beautiful. Where can people follow you, get your books, do, oh. check out the podcast that oh. I was on? <laughs> I, thank you so much for being on my podcast. It was during the COVID, we did it virtually. Oh, and honor. I love that I'm now here in person with you. It was so much fun to wait. And we were both very adamant that we were going to wait yeah, and do yeah. it here in, in person. So uh, yes, I'm doing a podcast. I've got a secret with Robin McGraw. And on Instagram, it's Robin underscore McGraw. And I also have, uh, I've got a secret with Robin McGraw and uh, dot com. So yes. Amazing. Guys, guys, I literally scour to find women that I can put in this seat and really learn from. And I've been such an admirer of this woman's for so long. And what she has done, the fact that she is this, this beautiful supporting wife and also this incredible badass entrepreneur who steps in to her own, own who she is and shows up freaking every day. And hopefully this episode was a true example of how she shows up every day as her true freaking self. So guys, go follow her. And if you're not following me, follow me at Lisa Billiou. And if you're not subscribed to this episode, did bring you value, click that subscribe button down there. And until next time, guys, be the hero of your own life. Peace out. What up, guys? Thanks so much for watching this video. If you'd like another dose of badassery, make sure you watch this video right here because I know you like it. But hey, also, while you're here, guys, you might as well click that subscribe button down there so you don't miss any future episodes. And of course, until next time, be the hero of your own life. Peace out.